Welcome to the next session of Introduction to Programming. And we've seen pointers for the first time. And I think it's important to demonstrate also what pointers can do. And I'll do this with an example question from the exam from last year, I believe, where I want to know whether people understand what pointers really can do. Um, ignore, first of all, these couple of functions over here. Let's just immediately start with the main function that you see here. So I initialize here a variable, which is an integer with a name num, to the value 208. Then, as the next uh, variable that I initialize, I initialize a pointer, uh, the pointer called ptr. And I immediately assign this pointer um, the reference of num, of this number over here. So what happens here is that somewhere in memory, I will uh, create myself a space. An integer is four bytes, basically, so it's a number that can be quite large, up to a couple of thousands. And uh, this value, or this value 208, is put over there in memory. And we know that this is an integer, and we know that it's somewhere in memory, and that we can refer to this as num, as a variable name num. Now, for the next line, we create a pointer somewhere else in memory. So this pointer is, again, somewhere in memory, which holds basically uh, the address of uh, something. We could have initialized num as null, meaning uh, we're not going to assign this pointer uh, to any real address. Uh, it's not going to point to another memory address. It's going to be pointing to null, which means this is not initialized yet. And then we could have set pointer equals, uh, we assign the pointer the address of um, num, where the value 208 is in. So this is exactly the same. In fact, this is how, um, if you don't immediately assign a pointer, uh, this should look. Let's go back to the beginning. So this is completely equivalent. And we're going to print both of them. Now, if you print num, it is obvious that we're going to then get 208. I hope that is very, very clear. But if you're then going to um, uh, print the pointer, that pointer is pointing to, um, so the value that pointer is pointing to, which is basically exactly this, we're also getting the value 208. So here we will have 208 eight here and 208 over here. And as we saw, this is called the referencing in chapter seven. Now, if we change the value via pointer, this is perfectly possible. We could have also set, um, num equals 72, for instance. Um, however, this is exactly the same as saying the thing that pointer is pointing to, which is an integer, um, should now get a value 72. Note that you can do this. Pointer itself is basically something completely different. But what it points to is an integer. That's what we defined over here. So we can give it the value 72. Now the thing is, what we changed is what is right here in num, in this particular um, memory address or in this particular memory space where we initialized num to 208, we're now changing 208 into 72. So when we output both num and the pointer value, um, uh, the value that, um, that the pointer is pointing to, we will get 2 times 72. So that is the first thing that might surprise someone if they didn't hear about pointers yet. Pointers allow you to have um, to refer to a piece in memory that is already initialized, for instance, like in here. Um, and it has several advantages, as we'll see later. Now, if you execute in functions, um, we've seen that uh, if you have a normal function, and this is something that we've seen, I think, in chapter three or four, um, if you add one, uh, in this case, so n uh, is incremented over here, um, so n is just given, this is not working uh, because you basically copy by value. Um, or you, uh, you, yeah, you, um, you copy the value into a new variable, which is called n here. This n, this variable n lives only within this function, and as soon as the function is left, it doesn't return anything. That's void over here. N is 
released again and this value of n is not accessible anymore. So if we pass num to add one, it is copied into another piece of memory called n and this piece of memory is then afterwards removed again uh, from our program. So in this case, this line 27 does not change anything in our program. It doesn't change the value of num. So when we output both num and uh, the value that pointer is uh, pointing to, uh, or PTR is pointing to, it doesn't change anything. So things will, change, will, will remain at 72 in this case. Now, one interesting other function could be where we, init, where we pass not the value itself, but the pointer. So we could, for instance, say add some, uh, for this is the name of the function, uh, and we pass the pointer as a reference. Now, this is completely different. In this case, we pass by reference. And when we pass by reference, we um, pass the exact um, piece of memory that we still have. Um, so in this case, n is pointing here to exactly what pointer is pointing to, which is this number over here. So if we then change the value that n is pointing to, that is what is over here, and we add 4, for instance, um, then what will happen is that um, n, if this was 72, which was, uh, which was set to here, will then become 76. Um, and since we're invoking this function over here, we are also um, uh, showing this. We're basically incrementing this function right here. So we are returning the value that n is pointing to. We first increase this, and then we return this value, um, which means it was 76. Now it is 77, and then we return this value. So over here, 77 is given. And num, so basically the value that this pointer has changed, which here was n, is then also uh, this value, 77. So when we print this out, so I'll save this, compile, and execute you will see that we have um, 208 as before here, the 72 for the next two as we've changed this over here. Um, then 72, nothing has changed after this add one because we just copy the value that was in, a, in num and we copy it into n, which is then you know, not there anymore after we release this function or um, we exit this function. And then finally, when we add some, we first add four here, and then we add one more here, and return that explicitly here, but also return num, which this function also changed, um, and both of them are 77. Now, interesting is, for instance, or this is something that we could also do at the exam, we could do a postfix. Um, in that case, we will get here 76. This is interesting because first, the value that n is pointing to is returned, and only then we increment this value over here. This means we first uh, pass the value of num over here and print it, and then afterwards we increment this value. And then here, num has been incremented, and uh, num is in that case um, 77. This is a little bit complicated to think about, especially because this is happening at the end of a function, um, but it does work. So I would recommend all of you to play with exactly this type of, um, uh, um, of, of, of little files to see or whether you understand what is happening within memory. Because once you understand what a pointer really does and what referencing really does, it is not that hard. Um, and then Later, when we see why it is being used, in which case it is being used, you'll find it much easier to work with. Right, so let's now continue with the slides. So we stopped at memory allocation uh, and we saw that there are different types of memory. On one hand, our code, our own code, is somewhere in memory, which is called a program memory. 
Then there is static data, which we should see in a second. There is dynamic data heap, which we'll also see. And there is the stack. The stack is something that we already quite know, uh, know, know, know quite well. I mean, the stack is something whenever you enter a function, for instance, you add the variables that are only living in that function into the stack. Whether this function is the main function, or any of the functions that are called in the main function, or any of the functions that are called in those functions in the main function. So all of those variables are basically added to the stack over here. So this and this piece of the program, of, of the memory, we already know quite well. Let's look at static data. Static data contains all global and static variables. Global variables we've tried to avoid. Global variables are the ones that are initialized or that, are, uh, that we write above the main function, for instance, in our CPP files. Those are variables that are living throughout the memory or throughout the lifespan of our program. Static variables are something very similar. Um, so, and basically these are variables that are put into a special part of the memory, and that's why we call them static, because they're in the static memory. Um, and what happens then is somewhere in a function, even in a function that is called from a function, from our main function, if we have normally, or if we would normally have an integer variable that we would uh, declare there, it would be removed after we exit this function. If, however, we add static in front of it, this variable is put from the stack over here into the static data section. And it's kept alive, so to say. So that is why um, their size has to be known at compile time. So if this is an area we can't resize this uh, at will, we basically need to define in our program how much memory this will, will, uh, will need. Because this is then reserved over here in this part of the memory. Um, so once we declare a static variable in the function, for instance, initially when this function is called, um, we will have number being zero, but then each time this function is called again and again and again, this number is not initialized to zero every time. No, this number is a static uh, variable that remains in the static part of the memory, and therefore whatever is this function returning is then not one at first, because it goes from 0 to 1, and then that is being returned. But then in the next uh, iteration, it will return 2, 3, etc. Because this piece in memory is kept there, and the initialization is only done for the first time when we initialize the static variable. This is a way to declare something that is, that is global in something that is not global. So this is a way of getting around the fact that if we declare um, variables that are normally always locally inside a function, and as soon as a function is left, those variables are gone, in this case, we can keep those, var uh, those variables. Um, and we can keep also the values of that variable. Now the next part is the stack. So this is the, um, the thing that we already know. Now, a stack, in essence, this is just some um, extra information that you don't really have to know for the exam, um, is really a data structure. A stack is a data structure which uh, requires two types of, of uh, operations. One is called a push, the other one is called a top operation. And the push is basically putting into something into the stack, or onto the stack, I think, is a better way of, of, of describing it, and top is basically returning the data from the top of the stack. Now, to make sure that you can get that and also remove this, there's also the pop function. So basically, if you have an empty stack over here, over here, um, and actually there should be a 42 right here, so this is an error. And if you push 12 on top of that, then the 12 is put on top of the uh, 42. If you then ask for that value, the topmost value, via top, you get 12. There's no way to get to this uh, value 42 in this case. You always can have access to the topmost uh, value of the stack, and that is it. And to remove this, you can call pop to actually remove 12, and then get access to the 42 over here. So this is um, a very peculiar data structure, perhaps, but it is quite efficient, and it is useful for many different things. 
Um, and this is how you have to think about the stack memory over here on the right hand side. It is something where you have only access to the topmost uh, data members. For instance, if a function is called, you have only access to those um, uh, pieces of memory, not any, uh, nothing else for the stack. Right. So that means for each active function, if you are operating or if you're uh, executing the statements within a certain function, then the stack contains an activation record or called stack frame where you have all the functions local variables, all the functions parameters that are within the braces, and the functions return address. The allocation delocation of stack is then controlled by the compiler and the processor, um, and the data on that stack is only alive for the duration of that function, or when you're calling statements within that function. Right. So th this is this is um, a, a bit of background on how this memory is uh, being handled or what type of data structure is behind this. And we've seen already uh, exactly the, the, um, this allocation of memory and uh, um, these procedures of, uh, of putting something, pushing something on the stack, um, asking the values and popping them away again um, with the uh, example of the factorial. So the factorial we saw here if we somewhere, for instance, in the main function, uh, execute this factorial function with a certain uh, value, 4, for instance, we see that it, um, with the argument for this function is called, um, and which then calls factorial again. Now, what is really happening is that in this uh, memory, we have a stack, and in this stack, all this information is called. So we then call n minus 1, being 3, and this is over here our stack, where we just pushed on a new uh, piece of data, where we pushed n, so the argument of the function, and where we push whatever this function results into. And this is done recursively, so for n is 3, then n is 2, then n is 1, then n is 0, once n is 0, we return this 1 over here, and then we start getting the information of the stack and also popping the stack, going to the previous element on the stack, the one before that, the one before that, the one before that, all the way until we get our result from the factorial of 4. So this allows us, uh, or the stack uh, structure allows us to look at only one specific function and all the variables that are required for this function, but still, in a recursive manner, look at all the previous instances as well, unless, uh, but without having really access to that. So you get only access to the previous instance when you pop the current instance, as you just seen. Right, heap memory is something else. In heap, you have a basically a large memory segment where we can allocate space for data dynamically. And this is at runtime. So without having to say, for instance, beforehand in our program that an array will be of size 24, we can, during our program, at runtime, declare that we suddenly have an array and we want, uh, later, for instance, after the declaration of that array, want to size it. We want to say that this is suddenly um, uh, holding the space for 24 elements. Whether those are integers, longs, characters, etc. And this is, for many problems, important because we don't always know how much data we have our, uh, to our availability. And up until now, we've only done this, or we've only dealt with this, by saying we just allocate a piece of memory that surely is big enough. So if we want to allocate memory for a name, then we just say we allocate 100 characters. That should be enough for most names. And this can lead us to little problems because then we perhaps cannot uh, store longer names and for many names, those are much shorter, we allocate memory that is not really necessary. So therefore, dynamically allocating memory is quite important and is quite interesting. And up until now, we don't really know how to do that at one time. Now for that, we have two new type of keywords that we introduce, new and delete. And the idea here is that with our pointers, we can declare that we have a piece of memory that we point to and that is pointing to an integer, so it holds an integer value. 
Now over here, we don't really have this piece of memory at all. And we were taught up until now to then declare or just uh, assign this to the null pointer. Because like how we started, we had this number somewhere else in memory and that really allocated it. But this was at not at runtime, this was somewhere where we, before we even, or where we were writing the program, we allocate this piece of memory with this integer called num. In this case, we just have our pointer and we don't really have anything that we uh, initialized or that we have reserved as a piece of memory that is an integer. Now, with new, you can do that. You can say that the pointer is assigned to a new integer. So in this case, we don't go around this uh, question and say we then create a new variable, which is called num, and this is an integer. No, in this case, we say we create a new integer and assign this to our pointer. And just as before, we can reference our pointer and then access the variable or assign this variable. Um, and then afterwards, because we reserved yet this, uh, now this piece of memory, we need to delete this pointer explicitly because we reserved somewhere in memory, uh, uh, reserved a space somewhere in memory. Um, this is not automatically deleted. So this will only be deleted if we, from new, also um, delete this, for instance, at the end of a function. And this is important because this is very powerful stuff. With this, we can, we can reserve a piece of memory at runtime, so without first declaring an array of 24 and then pointing to it, for instance. Now with this pointer, you can immediately reserve a piece of memory. And for an integer, this is just a few bytes, but we could reserve megabytes in one go, dynamically, at runtime. The only thing that we have to take care of is that we need to reserve this, and whenever you need to reserve this and you don't need this anymore, for instance, at the end of a function, or when you don't really deal with this anymore, you need to explicitly delete this memory. Otherwise, if you, for instance, have uh, no use for this pointer anymore, or this pointer was, for instance, um, uh, initialized in a function or um, defined and initialized in a function, and this function is left, then you don't have any more access to this pointer, but this memory is still reserved. And this leads to most of the problems in programming. And this is exactly what this slide is about. So if you forget to delete the memory that you reserved earlier, um, then you have a, a thing called memory leak. So here's an example. You have a function called evil, because it's a very evil function with no arguments and nothing being returned. But in this evil function, you basically um, define a pointer to an integer, and you also reserve some memory for that. Now, as soon as evil is exited, so as soon as you return this from this function, um, in your program, a new integer was reserved, so somewhere in memory, um, four bytes have been reserved. But those four bytes are now there, and after you exit this function, this cannot be reached anymore because the pointer to this piece of memory is gone. You can't access this piece of memory anymore. However, it is still um, uh, reserved in the heap part of the memory. So it cannot be freed anymore after you exit this function. Now imagine doing this function a hundred times a second or many times because in many programs things happen in a loop and you do this multiple times, then suddenly you're reserving memory without being able to exit it, uh, access it anymore afterwards. And this way you get more and more and more and more memory um, to your availability that you're not able to use anymore. And that way you can, for instance, crash a memory because eventually you run out of memory. And these things happen all the time. Um, and especially as your data structures that you create, for instance with classes, get more complex, uh, these things are easy to forget. Typically, whenever we uh, have new, we need to make sure that we somehow have delete and that whenever we create something, we properly clean up after ourselves with the delete function, uh, with the delete keywords. Another thing we have to take care of is that we delete only once. So if you delete a variable that has been already deleted, will crash your program or will be pointed out by your uh, compiler. 
Uh, but it could also, in some older systems or in some systems that don't do these checks, uh, corrupt the memory management on the heap. So as we've already seen, if you have a deleted, uh, if you delete a pointer, and it's uh, or, or if you have a pointer that is not directly assigned to something, it is always great to point this at null. In that case, we uh, communicate to our compiler this is a pointer that we will use later, but for now we have a pointer that is not pointing at a significant memory location. So therefore, we let we assign this pointer to null. And that we can do whenever we have deleted a pointer or deleted the space that um, uh, the pointer is pointing to. In that case, we say we explicitly assign pointer the pointer to null, so we know for the remainder statements afterwards that this pointer should not be um, is not pointing to a piece of memory. Right. And this is then in C++ defined in such, you know, if you delete a null pointer, this is safe. This is not a problem at all. However, if this is not a null pointer, um, if this is not initialized um, or not deleted, then we call this a dangling pointer. And it is really dangerous uh, to have this um, because whenever you dereference this dangling pointer, so uh, whenever you try to access a piece of memory that is not really reserved for you, um, you might uh, alter other programs' piece of memory if the operating system allows this, or you might uh, alter things in your own program that you were not meant to alter, other variables, for instance. Right, and then finally, um, we can create and delete these objects on the heap as, uh, with the new and the delete um, uh, keywords that we have just seen. So here we, for instance, have a function called short-lived cat where we create a cat and also delete it afterwards. So only for this particular function, we create a cat. And we can do this at runtime by saying we create immediately a cat over here um, and uh, with the new keywords and the constructor, we say that the cat has age five directly and we therefore have a pointer to a cat that now allows us to deal with this cat. So instead of creating a new object of class cat, we create a pointer to a, 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 an object of class cat that does not have a specific name. We can basically, with the referencing, um, access this particular object. And then later, we, with, by deleting the pointer and directly assigning to null, we can just remove this cat. And by uh, that, we can basically access members on the heap object. So basically, once we have created our cat of age 5, we can set its weight by doing exactly this, by dereferencing the pointer. And then we have our dot operator, or not operator, but we have basically the accessor that allows us then to um, uh, call a function that is uh, part of the cat class. For instance, we can set the weight of the cat to seven kilograms. But then we also have another uh, other alternative with uh, this uh, this uh, piece of character or these two characters. We can do exactly the same. So instead of having uh, to dereference our pointer, and as usual, then we uh, have this object, basically, that of type cat, we can say we have a pointer to a cat object. And in that case, we can't use this because this is a pointer to a cat object. But we can have with this pointer um, symbol then also access everything that belongs to our cat. And this basically finalizes everything that we've seen about uh, pointers. So pointer allows us then for a, uh, an object of a certain class to access its member data and functions with this. When we dereference it, or if we don't dereference this pointer, we can basically do this with this arrow over here. It's exactly the same. And it's often much simpler because here we know that it's a pointer to a cat object without explicitly having this as a variable in our program. And we say this, this pointer is then um, uh, executing the set weight function with parameter 7. And then we delete the whole thing again. So this operator can also be used to access data members. So we don't only just call functions of this particular class, but we can also access data members. And this is it for today. So next time 
we continue with garbage collection.